There's a true need for local churches and individual Christians to be committed to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ today. When this happened in the first century, the gospel was spread and disciples multiplied, according to Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. However, this kind of multiplication is often not seen today. And there may be many different reasons why, and we could spend a whole study just talking about all of those different reasons and different components that go into people accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, what we must be careful to evaluate is, are we leaving the seed in the barn? Haggai chapter 2 and verse 19 asks that question, is the seed still in the barn? It's only when we diligently sow the seed of God's Word, even when it costs us so much we're, we're even brought to tears, that we'll be able to rejoice at the harvest. Psalm 126 and verses 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Though one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed, he will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. We need to be very diligent that we are sowing the word of God in the hearts of men and women throughout this world. Again, even when there's personal sacrifice and, and cost that's involved in how we do that. A biblical model for doing that that very thing is what we might just simply call a be everywhere model. You know, that's a model that many businesses uh, will use as they not only utilize one avenue to try to get their messaging about their products and services and so forth out there in front of other people's eyes, um, but they want to use as many channels as possible, as many different avenues as they can. And so it should be with those who try to plant and water the seed of God's Word. We don't want to just use a, just one particular way of trying to share that message, but we want to use as many a- avenues that God opens to us as possible. This is a model that we can see throughout the New Testament. So the purpose of the, this lesson is to learn how local churches and Christians should utilize the be everywhere model in evangelism today. So let's spend the first part of our study here just really looking into the scriptures and finding out that this really is a model that you can see in the scriptures that has been successful in sharing the gospel with many people. Let's just walk through some passages. We could certainly read a great number of passages in addition to these, but let's just focus on these select passages as we walk to just get a snapshot of how the gospel is spread. Let's begin when Jesus was walking on this earth in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, you can read the first 42 verses. We're not going to do that for the sake of time. But I want you to notice how Jesus overcame some barriers to talk to this Samaritan woman. You can read verses 4 through 10. But let's, for the purpose of this study, read verses 6 through 9 at this, at this time. It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So, we notice that Jesus overcame some barriers to talk to her. For one, um, he overcame the barrier, as this passage points out, of a Jew talking to a Samaritan, which was just um, something that was not done um, in that culture. You also have a barrier of a male talking to a woman. You have a barrier of um, tiredness 
that's identified in this text regarding Jesus in particular. And then you have a barrier that this is a, a woman who's living in sin. And so from many people's standpoints, they would not have talked with this woman. But Jesus overcame barriers to talk to her. And this resulted in the woman believing in him, as you go on and read through John chapter 4. And it resulted in others then believing in him, as she goes back into the, um, the city and tells others about Jesus, who she has just discovered to be the Messiah. You can see that in verses 28 and 29. It says, Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? I want you to notice she left her water jar. That's why she had come to that well. And sometimes we need to leave other things in order to go and tell this wonderful message. But I want you to step back and I want you to appreciate how both Jesus and the woman taught people wherever they were and whenever they could. Jesus taught her when she came to the well, despite the barriers. And then she goes and teaches anybody she can find in the city to tell what she had just discovered, that the Messiah was in fact here. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, the Great Commission, as recorded by Mark, then he, that is Jesus, said to them, the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now Jesus was about to ascend uh, back into heaven, of course. But Jesus, before he left, realized that, and he had known for um, uh, for all time, he, he, he knew that he needed to entrust that great work that he had come to do to, to, to seek and to save the lost, that now he needed to entrust the message of salvation to his apostles so it could be spread far and wide throughout this world. And that's exactly what he did here in this passage, that he would no longer be in the world to teach the, work, uh, to teach the lost, but this work would be entrusted to his apostles and disciples. And as we'll see, they went about doing this work, spreading the gospel wherever they would go. So let's watch the Great Commission in action now as we continue. Let's go to Acts chapter 5 and we notice in verse 42. It says, Every day in the temple and in various homes they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now in the context, the apostles had just been um, imprisoned and beaten prior to this, and they were forbidden, don't tell anybody about Jesus, don't preach in Jesus' name anymore. But not only did they continue to preach in Jesus' name, but they also tried to utilize as many avenues as they could every day. And this passage particularly tells us, right, they continued to preach in the temple, um, to the, the Jewish worshipers who would have been there, and they also taught in various homes. And I want you to notice they were doing this every day. So every day utilizing whatever opportunities they had at that time to share the good news about Jesus Christ as the Messiah with whoever they could. Next, let's notice Acts chapter 8 and in verse 4. It says, so those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. In the context, there was um, a great persecution that arose against the church in Jerusalem. Now, prior to that, the gospel had kind of, uh, we, as far as what we read in Acts at least, the gospel had been really spread there in and around Jerusalem. But now this persecution really forced people out of Jerusalem, uh, forced many of the disciples out of Jerusalem. And what I want us to notice from this passage in particular is that as they left Jerusalem and went various places, they took the word of God with them. They didn't leave the word of God in Jerusalem and say, oh, that, you know, that, that's what caused us this persecution. No, they, they took that message and held on to it and shared it with others wherever they went. 
Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 24, even demonstrates how they took the gospel as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And people responded to the gospel in those places as they took the gospel with them. But please notice, you know, this this was not just being done by those who were evangelists or apostles or something like that. These were, as we might say, ordinary Christians taking the gospel with them wherever they went. In Acts chapter 17 and in verse 6, it says, When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Specifically, as it talks about Paul as he's preaching the gospel and here in Thessalonica he and his companions you can notice were not trying to have just some very minimal impact through the gospel on the society that they taught instead here's how people looked at Paul here's that they looked at Paul and the message that he preached and said these are people who are turning the world upside down Certainly that indicates to us that they were trying to share the gospel as far and wide as possible wherever they would go. They wanted people to learn the saving message about Jesus Christ and come to obedience in Him. Later in Acts chapter 17, we can also read then in verses 16 and 17. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So here's Paul, and he's in the city of Athens, and he's alone in the city of Athens, and he sees all of these idols that the city is devoted over to, and, and he's deeply disturbed by that. And he, is, he, he de- determines, of course, he just can't sit there and do nothing and say nothing. Instead, he knows that he needs to go and teach those people about their ways of religious ignorance. And so that's what he does. And I want you to notice that he tried to reach people where they were. Notice how this passage shows us that, they, that he talked to the Jewish worshipers of God who met in the synagogue. And then he also taught, talked to people in the marketplaces as they happened to be there. So he utilized multiple avenues to try to reach people with the gospel, and he was busy trying to reach them every single day. Next. As we notice in Acts chapter 19, and we go down to verse 26 of this chapter, it says, You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. This passage is specifically talking about um, or, or recording one man's accusation against Paul. Here was a man who, um, who was devoted to this false goddess Artemis. And so here is how he perceives Paul. Here's a man who is, who is uh, spreading this message through Ephesus, but also in, in almost all of Asia. Again, so we step back from this and we can appreciate that Paul was working to spread the gospel far and wide. And this should be attributed to the, eff- to the efforts of taking the gospel anywhere he could and utilizing as many different effective avenues as possible for trying to spread that message. Next, we go to Acts chapter 20 and in verse 20. Paul says, you know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. So in this passage, Paul discussed his past work 
at Ephesus while he was meeting with the elders from the church in Ephesus. They were meeting in Miletus, and he was talking about his work there when he was with them in Ephesus and how he had taught the people what they needed to hear. Didn't hear, hold back anything that was profitable for them, and also how he would teach them in both public and private settings. We know that he utilized public settings such as the synagogue and the marketplace. But he also went house to house spreading this message. So just appreciate very much from this passage that Paul was active not just in one channel. He didn't just go into the synagogues to preach, and that be the only way he did that. Instead, he utilized multiple avenues of trying to share the message with others so people would follow Jesus Christ. Now, if we go into the book of 1 Thessalonians to chapter 1 and in verse 8, it tells us, For the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we don't need to say anything. So here's the church in Thessalonica who did whatever they could to share the gospel. They used the opportunities and the abilities they had, I, I believe individually and collectively, to share the good news of God's Word, to ring out God's message both locally and beyond. And God only knows the kind of impact that this had for Jesus. God only knows how many people came to, the, to faith in Jesus Christ through the efforts of this particular congregation. And God only knows how many congregations perhaps may have been started in various places because of these efforts that Paul is acknowledging right here in this verse. Next, we notice 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, But if I should be delayed, I have written, so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Although no specific strategy is outlined in this particular passage, it does demonstrate a certain mentality that all, all of God's people must have, not just certain ones, but that all of God's people must have. And this is the mentality that God's church should be considered as the pillar and foundation of the truth. That is, God's people are responsible for holding up God's word, his truth, in this world. So we have the responsibility as God's people to proclaim God's message to a lost and dying world. And so if we're going to do that effectively, we need to utilize as many uh, avenues and doors that God opens to us as we can. Next, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. It tells us, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. While there have been many strategies that have been used in preaching God's message, God's simple plan is outlined here, and we need to really appreciate it. As people learn and obey God's message, it becomes then our responsibility to share that message with someone else, who will then share that message with someone else, who will then share that message with someone else, and on and on and on it goes. So we need to recognize that God wants all hands on deck, so to speak, in the work of evangelism, not for it just to be um, committed to a few individuals to carry out throughout this world, but instead every Christian doing whatever he or she can do to take that message to someone else. And then finally, let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 23. Paul says, If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. After Jesus gave the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, 
the, the apostles and then disciples got involved in fulfilling that work. And we have seen different snapshots as we have walked through all of these passages. We have seen snapshots about how the apostles and how the Christians did this very work. And I want us to notice that what Paul is saying in this particular passage is that this was accomplished within 30 years, approximately. Now Paul steps back and says that the gospel has been proclaimed in all creation. And let's just appreciate that. And how did they do this? How did they go from the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation to now Paul saying it happened? How did they do it? Well, they didn't start with large numbers. We read of about 120 that um, that are mentioned in Acts chapter 1. They didn't start with um, a large amount of resources and uh, financially and buildings and all those kinds of things. They didn't have a lot of, they didn't have any of the the modern conveniences of travel and technology that we have today. So they did not have a lot that we have, but yet they did it. How did they do it? Well, they simply had a zeal to spread the message of God's word wherever they went. And that zeal is worth far more than anything else. So, having looked at this model and seeing its presence in the New Testament, let's now move on and just make some observations. Let's take a moment to observe some common problems with today's evangelistic model. So, go from what we've been looking at to what you can observe a lot of times today. Today, you can observe that a lot of times people in churches are afraid or unwilling to change from traditional methods of evangelism. Sometimes we get set in here's what we've always done and here's uh, this is exactly how we do this. Now certainly I am not at all suggesting that we can change God's message to fit the times and I am not at all suggesting that we ever get involved in anything that God does not authorize us to be involved in. But Within those things God has authorized and teaching the message that God has given us, we need to be willing to adapt our approaches to evangelism within the general authority that God has given to us to become more effective and utilize opportunities that are available today, lest we miss out on opportunities, on doors that God has opened for us. But so many are unafraid or, or are afraid and are unwilling to change. Next, we can observe the problem that sometimes the church buildings are used as the center for all of the evangelistic efforts that are done. That any kind of evangelism that takes place can only be done within the confines of it of the church's meeting place. Now, certainly there's nothing wrong with using the church building in evangelistic efforts, and there are times where it may even be effective to do so. But I think it is a great mistake if that's the only way that we look to share the gospel with others, is within that uh, building. It will certainly, while it is one tool that we can use, it will not be as effective as going to where the lost are and trying to teach them. Next, We can observe the problem that other things are often considered to be more important than reaching the law. Sometimes we as individuals or as churches can get so distracted by all the different things that there are to do and that um, different pieces that consume our time. And while evangelism is not the only work that we have as individuals or as congregations, but it is also certainly not the least important thing that we have been given to do and certainly must not be neglected for less important things. Sometimes, for example, the, uh, the various churches get uh, too focused on the upkeep of the meeting place, so all the efforts and money and resources and everything's poured into that instead 
of maybe a more effective use of trying to share the message of the gospel with others. Next, we have uh, a pro there is a problem of one size fits all approaches. You know, sometimes congregations will get into a certain uh, certain way that they've always done things, as we talked about a little bit ago, um, and they will define their evangelistic efforts through only the lens of one particular programs. Maybe it's a door-to-door -door campaign, maybe it's gospel meetings or a radio program or whatever. And so sometimes um, congregations will only look at evangelism through that particular approach, or even individuals can do that. And while there's nothing wrong with an organized evangelistic program that's authorized by God, they may have their place, they may miss many other opportunities that God opens up to us and uh, to, to teach His Word. And instead of viewing that one program as the only evangelistic efforts that can happen, we need instead to view our evangelism or those programs as one of a, one piece of a larger strategy of trying to share the gospel um, with those around us. Next, we can observe a problem of every Christian not preaching. While there's nothing wrong with a local church to utilize a local evangelist, for example, working with them, sometimes it is that, um, that members of the church can view the evangelist, or whoever it may be, as the one who does the work, and that their, their responsibility is something different, that evangelism is not their work. But yet, what we find in Scripture is that every member of God's uh, church, of Christ's body, should, should be equipped in order to accomplish God's work, Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, and should actively be involved in helping the gospel spread however he or she can. But that often just simply does not happen, or at least not to the extent that God wants it to happen. So you can observe some common problems today and set this in contrast with what we just talk, read and talked about from um, the evangelistic models that we can see in the New Testament. Now, let's make some applications. How can we be everywhere today? Well, what this means is that we must utilize as many doors for the Word as possible. The first century model shows us how the gospel was spread throughout the world in about 30 years, from Mark 16, verse 15, through Colossians 1, and verse 23. This involved disciples and churches preaching the gospel wherever and whenever they could, it involved men who dedicated their lives as evangelists and churches who sent men to preach. To spread God's word effectively today, disciples and churches must constantly be praying for and watching for God to open doors for the word to be spread. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Paul asks his brethren, or tells his brethren, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. We need to be praying for these opportunities, watching for these opportunities. And the more doors that we can utilize effectively, the more people will be reached with a saving gospel message. So look carefully around you and be looking for what doors have been opened. What are the avenues that I can utilize to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody else. 
Well, let's take a few moments, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but let's consider the following areas. And, spends, and what I would encourage you to do in each one of these is to spend time brainstorming what are ways we can spread the gospel through these areas. So, let's begin thinking about church assemblies, such as we can utilize these church assemblies to share the gospel, such as through weekly assemblies, special assemblies, maybe with have, have special topics, or assemblies at various locations, even. Second, we can support evangelists, both in your own local area or in multiple areas, to send men who are dedicated to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you can be a part of their work by sending them financially, giving them what they need to go and share the gospel. Third, you can be visible in public places. Maybe that looks like a booth that you can set up at a fair or a festival locally, or maybe it's some kind of public advertising that you can do. Maybe it's something else. Fourth, you can utilize the media. Right? Whatever um, media is consumed in your particular area, you can put content out there through that media or advertisements that can be consumed by those who are looking at media or listening to media or watching media or whatever that they already consume anyways. Next, certainly the internet is one of the marketplaces that we have today. And so you can utilize websites and social media platforms and podcasts and online courses and webinars and many different things that are there online. Next, you can use small group Bible studies. Invite people to come into these Bible studies. You can have those Bible studies at the regular meeting place that the church meets or in homes or at restaurants or, or whatever. And you can utilize those as opportunities to invite folks to come and study God's Word. Next, you can utilize um, the methods of cold calling. Maybe that's door knocking or putting door hangers on those doors in the community to spread your message of the gospel or mass mailings or whatever it might be that you can utilize. Or eighth, you can utilize relationships. Certainly you can utilize your conversations throughout any given day and should be looking to have conversations with others. Or you can have Bible studies with people that you know and people that you meet and so forth. And so you just step back from these. And there, I'm sure there are many other ways. But you can start with these eight that are listed. And you can go through and you can think about how you can utilize perhaps each one, either individually or congregationally, and go through and think about how you can make use of these various avenues. What are the specific doors in those avenues that God has opened to you? For his word. Take some time and really step back and evaluate. Come up with ideas and always be flexible to continue thinking about new ways that you can share the gospel with others. Keep your eyes open for doors for the word in these areas as well as in other areas. And again, both churches and individual Christians can try to utilize as many strategies and avenues as possible and as authorized by God to share the gospel with others. We'll close the lesson there today. But how effective are you and the congregation you work with in spreading God's saving message to the lost? Are you following the strategy that we can see and that we have seen in the New Testament scriptures to be everywhere? Or are you and the church you work with neglecting this great work by leaving the seed in the barn? Certainly, those who love God and love others will want to do the most they can to spread God's saving message as far and wide as possible.